There were there are two other classes of of um, two other developments in theoretical physics that also I think reinforce this that I also wrote about in the book. Uh, one is um, the, the one one is the the the, the singularity theorems that Hawking and Penrose and uh, George Ellis uh, proved in the 1960s and 70s. And then there's something called the um, bord guth vilenkin theorem, which I think is even a tighter uh, physics proof of a beginning. I think that there is a loophole with the Hawking, Penrose, um, uh, uh, Ellis singularity theorem, although it's, it's I think, very suggestive and, and highly indicative of a beginning. I mean, I'll, I'll, let me run it just Please, br- briefly because it's, it's, it's a fun thing to think about. So Hawking is uh, doing b- black hole physics for his PhD in the 1960s. And he's at Cambridge and he's having these neurological symptoms and he's, he's diagnosed with ALS. He gets very, very discouraged. He thinks he's going to quit. And he's encouraged to press on by uh, close friends and he does. And he ends up uh, writing this brilliant thesis where he has one chapter where he's thinking about what the cosmologists are talking about is that we've got this expanding universe and if the universe is ex- expanding in the forward direction of time, then matter is getting more and more diffuse over time. Now, um, general, he, gen, part of his thesis involves general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And according to Einstein, uh, the, a massive body actually curves the fabric of space or space-time. So if you're going in the forward direction of time, space is getting less and less curved uh, and matter more and more diffuse. But if you're going in the reverse direction of time, the matter is getting more and more densely concentrated at every successive point in the finite past until, again, you reach a limiting case where the matter gets so densely concentrated that space gets so tightly curved that it can't get any more tightly curved. It can't get any more densely concentrated. And you move towards a point of infinite density and infinite curvature. You get to a limiting case. Now, infinite curvature corresponds to zero spatial volume. And so the picture of the origin of the universe that sort of intuitively flows from this is one where you get not just matter and energy arising, but space and time come into existence at that, at that zero point. And um, he presents this in his PhD thesis, mm. and he's fear and trepidation getting examined, but one of his ex- examiners, they're nitpicking all these different things, but then they say, hey, the idea of a, of, of a black hole at the beginning of the universe, a space-time singularity, this is brilliant, congratulations, Dr. Hawking, and they shove the, the thesis book back over t- to him, and he's passed. Uh, but w- one of them says, now go work out the maths. And he ends up working out the math of this intuitive proof that he develops with uh, Sir Roger Penrose, with whom you have done a yes. wonderful interview, and, and George Ellis, whom I've had the occasion to meet. And, and so they end up producing several of these singularity theorems, suggesting that if general relativity is true, then there must have been a beginning. This is on, indepe- on grounds independent of all the things from observational astronomy. Now, there's a loophole with that, and that is that in the very tiniest smidgens of space-time, um, inside 10 to the minus 43rd of a second, or what they call Planck time, quantum effects might have been such that we would have to alter our ideas of how gravity worked. And so out of that has come something called uh, an impulse uh, or, a, or different theories of what are called quantum gravity or quantum cosmology. And um, I think you've had some conversations on the show about that as well. Sure. Um, in my book, I show that that's, that is a possible, uh, another possible cosmological model. But like the conclusion that the universe had a definite beginning, I think those models also have theistic implications, and I can explain why. Okay. Um, maybe we bracket that. Okay. Then the third, there's a, yet a third proof, though, of a beginning that come that by um, three physicists, Bord, Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin. And it's not based on general relativity. It's not based on ideas of what gravity was like in the early universe, but based on ideas of special relativity. It's a little tricky to explain easily, but basically they show that there is, again, a limiting case and therefore a definite beginning uh, to, to time. And, uh, and therefore, and, and that it does not have the same loophole that the, the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose. So what I've said in my, I, what I argue in the book is that a body of evidence from ab- observational astronomy, a strong indicator from theoretical physics, namely the singularity theorems of Hawking et al., and then a very 
compelling proof from Bordguth and Valinkin all point to the same conclusion, that as best we can tell, the universe had a beginning. And I think that's the best we can do in science, but that is a pretty weighty um, range of testimony uh, supporting the same conclusion. Did you ever read any Terence McKenna? I haven't. Terence McKenna had a very funny thing that he said about science. He said, science wants you to believe that it's all about measurement and reason if you allow them one miracle. That one <laughs> miracle is the Big Bang. Yes. That all things come from the most preposterous idea ever. Yeah. That everything came from nothing yeah. in one big miracle. That's right. I completely I totally agree paraphrased that. it. Yeah, he I probably that. said it far more well, eloquently. Well, this, but. This, was, this was Sir Fred Hoyle's objection to the Big Bang. Mm. He, was, he said he was a, do, a Democritean. He didn't believe, he said, nothing comes from nothing. And I, do, I simply refuse to believe that, that the physical universe came from nothing physical. And moreover, he said it smacks of the Genesis account, which he detested. And so he rejected the Big Bang and formulated this steady state model um, that was later, I think, decisively refuted by um, the discovery of the cosmic background radiation. His, uh, it happens. I've, I've had funny coincidental meetings with Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and Thomas Gold, all three of the, the architects of the steady state mod model. I met Bondi and Hoyle when I was a PhD student in Cambridge. And Hoyle held on to his dying day for the, the steady state. But uh, Bondi, uh, uh, actually, we had a conversation about it, and he said that, that, well, it turned out that it was a brilliant idea. It was a beautiful idea, just that it turned out that everything about it was wrong, and he, re he rejected <laughs> it. So, uh, but uh, later, Hoyle had his own conversion to a kind of quasi-theistic worldview because of his discovery of the fine-tuning parameters. But the, the, the point is that the materialists did not expect to have this evidence for the beginning. Hoyle thought that, you know, the laws of physics were the, the, the first law of uh, conservation of matter and energy. Uh, and matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed except at the Big Bang. <laughs> and, mm. so, and he didn't like that, but eventually I think the physics community came around. There were so many indicators of that beginning event.